I don't have a problem with essential oils, and despite me making a video on questions for pseudoscience about essential oils, I actually own a vial of clove oil for when I have canker sores. And to be honest, they're not that big of a deal. Sure, the homeopathic culture is a little weird, and the mid-level marketing companies are questionable, but as a scientist, it's nothing I'm too concerned about. Besides, most of the things people use essential oils for are benign, like using it as an aroma to relax, or adding it to food, or for general cleaning purposes. Purposes. Even if you use it for mild ailments like muscle aches or indigestion, it's okay. And there's actually some evidence to back this up. Generally speaking, essential oils are alright. What's not alright is this section of the graph right here. Medical uses. It's one thing to treat muscle aches or an upset stomach, but when you're treating serious health conditions like autoimmune disorders, ADHD, fungal infections, cancer, diabetes, and antibiotics, that's where essential oils aren't okay. Now I just want to preface that I'm not saying essential oils aren't useful medicine because they're essential oils or are sourced from plants. Quite the contrary, a fair amount of life-saving medicine has come from plants. So to say that something isn't medicinal because its source seems unlikely to be useful is not a valid argument. Instead, an experienced scientist rejects the efficacy of a substance when there is a lack of legitimate evidence. There's ideas floating around the internet and some homeopathic groups that essential oils cure cancer and many other absurd claims, because some wellness professionals, or laymen, are the ones making the absurd claims. And they're not just saying it, they're using actual scientific evidence to solidify their points. However, unlike the robust and brilliant experiments that gave us the cure for polio and perfected organ transplants, these studies are more akin to banging two rocks together to see what sticks. But where do these studies come from, and why aren't they valid? Well, a little background first. When a drug is being developed, it goes through numerous phases of testing. First, starting with the discovery phase, where scientists find candidate drugs for a disease or a condition. From there, they perform mechanism studies to understand how it works. Once the general workings of the drug is understood, it moves to clinical trials where it's tested on humans. In the early phases of testing prior to being tested on humans, the drug is tested in vitro, which is testing the drug or substance outside the body, usually in a petri dish or a test tube. In vitro studies are used because they're fast, cheap, and can be easily quantified. If the drug has promising results, it's put through more robust testing on animals and then humans. From here, the FDA approves or denies it. It's these quick, cheap in vitro studies that essential oil retailers use as proof of their medicinal properties. Now, as an ignorant layman, you might say, but the in vitro tests showed that the drug worked, so that's why it went on to clinical trials. Wrong. <laughs> Actually, the drug showed promising results, was tested on humans, and was then proven to work with positive results. Preclinical trials hold no water in terms of actually working. You need human trials to prove that. Besides, cell culture tests tend to have low tolerances to anything that's tested on them and don't equate to testing in the human body. In fact, there's a lot of things you could place in a petri dish and call it anti-cancer. You could argue gasoline is an antibiotic against MRSA. Alright guys, here's my test on gasoline effects against MRSA. As you can see here, I have my petri dish full of agar, which has the MRSA bacteria in it. And we're just going to grab some gasoline and just pour it on top. Alrighty. This is to see if gasoline kills MRSA. So as you can see, uh, there is no more MRSA going on this petri dish, so it's concluded that gasoline kills MRSA, so you can take gasoline now if you have this terrible infection. Using in vitro studies to prove essential oils are medicine is like building a foundation of a house and then saying you built an entire house. One wellness professional who's notorious for this is this guy. Let, yeah, look here. Medicine. 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 Dr. Josh Axe, or Travis Stork Light, is a trained chiropractor and a doctor in naturopathic medicine, and unlike Travis Stork, is not a medical doctor. There we are. He promotes and sells homeopathic remedies ranging from food supplements to hygiene products. 
One of his most popular products is essential oils, which he claims does some pretty extraordinary things. I was reading an, uh, a study where they found, they were comparing different herbs and oils, and they found oregano to be the strongest in terms of its, some of its antifungal Absolutely. properties, so, so powerful at treating infections. So oregano is powerful at fighting off all forms of pathogens. You know, myrrh oil, which has been shown to cause apoptosis of cells, so it's actually mm. programming cell death of cancer cells. Now, something unique about oregano is not only is it antibacterial, it's also antifungal, antiparasitic, it fights off yeast as well. If you've got candida, you absolutely need to be inhaling and consuming clove and oregano to a number of things, but one of the biggest benefits of cinnamon is it actually helps in killing off dangerous microbes. Now listen, there's a story in the Bible. They did when this whole camp was sick with a plague, they actually fumigated it with cinnamon oil and it said it killed off the plague and strengthened the kidneys in Chinese medicine. It's known to help strengthen the kidney chi and overall energy. Josh backs up his claims with a litany of scientific studies and to a regular person, this would be enough evidence that. And the unique thing here is that it's actually been shown to fight off MRSA. However, these are not robust scientific studies involving human trials, but rather hollow in vitro studies performed on simple cell and tissue cultures. In fact, let's check one out right now. Um, so potent antioxidant and okay, so anti-cancer benefits. So uh, a lab-based study found that myrrh also has potential anti-cancer benefits. Now uh, this here is a red flag, a lab-based study. So this is not tested. So this, this myrrh was not tested on, on a person with cancer or on like, uh, like a tumor, this is just, um, if you read through it, this is just on cancer cells in an in vitro study. So this does not prove uh, that myrrh is anti-cancer. Uh, granted, they did say it's potential anti-cancer benefits, and they're not saying, yeah, it's proven to kill cancer, but that's still, I mean, if you're like an average Joe, and you, you go onto this page and you're like, oh, there's 10 proven myrrh benefits. Okay, let's see what we have here. Uh, uh, potent antioxidant that's proven okay and we have uh, anti-cancer but like you're not gonna read through this little blurb here and you're definitely not gonna read through the study and the study you know human cancer cells uh, they tested it on a, on a cell culture you know and so basically all they did was is they is they uh, uh, took a what kind of was it it was gynecological cancer and they grew the uh, culture and then they exposed it to uh, myrrh oil and the myrrh oil managed to kill or reduce the uh, cancer population in the in the petri dish and it's like well hey it, ki it killed the cancer it has anti-cancer benefits but that's not a big accomplishment a lot of things like I said before will kill a uh, culture of cancer cells you know salt water will kill cancer cells um, Killing cancer cells in, in an isolated environment is, again, you could do that with like sunlight, you know. Um, but to kill cancer cells in the human body where they're, where they're growing and they're hard to reach and they're spreading, that's much different than just having a static, you know, little, little colony. It's like, hey, I killed the cancer cells. Well, like you stepped on them, you killed them. Wow, my foot is now anti-cancer. Um, so that's kind of bad. Antibacterial and antifungal benefits. Uh, historically, myrrh was used to treat wounds and prevent infections. Um, this is true. Um, kind of like from ancient Israel a couple thousand years ago, but I mean, at least it's, you know, a little history lesson there too. Um, it can still be used in this manner on minor fungal irritations such as athlete's foot, bad breath. So it can still be used in this manner on minor fungal irritation such as athlete's foot and bad breath, etc., etc. Um, let's see what the study says then. So they're saying it can be used on athlete's foot, like an actual human infection, only the study isn't tested on a human with a fungal infection. It's tested on a disc diffusion assay. So again, they took a culture of fungus, uh, Aspergillus, Exposed it to a myrrh oil, you know, uh, concentration or whatever, some kind of way they they uh, exposed it to it, and it killed the 
fungus. Woohoo! I mean, again, that's that's not a big accomplishment. A lot of things will kill any any kind of culture in a um, petri dish. Now, what's hard about killing fungus is that <clears throat> uh, antibiotics will target bacteria and they won't target the host, whereas fungus are eukaryotes, as are humans. So it's very hard to find um, remedies that will kill um, the fungus. And, you know, I mean, all, all they had to do was just find a study where they tested myrrh oil on a person with um, a fungal infection. And then they could have said, hey, yeah, but instead they, they did this. And my thought is it is they either couldn't find a study or there were studies that used myrrh oil and it didn't, it wasn't effective. So this is also a red flag. That's very bad. Okay. Um... Myrrh oil can uh, help fight certain types of bacteria. For example, it seems in lab studies to be potent against staph infections. Interesting. <clears throat> well, first off, it seems, so they're not even like, yeah, it's proven. It's like, it seems, so that's, you know, again, if you're just like the average person going through this, you're not going to read this whole blurb and be like, hmm, well, it seems, so I guess it's not, you know, clinically proven. Um, it seems in lab studies to be potent against staph infections. So this here is a problem. They're saying that myrrh oil is effective in you know, reducing or, or treating staph infections. But the study that they have here is not on a case where they treated a person with staph infection. Um, instead, what they did was they took myrrh oil and they took uh, you know, a, a staph colony and uh, they treated the colony with um, myrrh oil, and it inhibited, okay, it, it inhibited the biofilm for the biofilm formation, meaning, you know, it reduced the growth or like the, the spreading of um, the uh, staph bacteria. That is not the same as saying it is a potent is potent against staph infections. If they had said it seems in lab studies that it kills back, it, it kills staph. Uh, cultures, you know, in a Petri dish, I'm like, yeah, five stars, that's perfect. But they didn't. And then what's funny too is um, they then, I think they in injected or whatever, but they, they exposed a nematode to the staph bacteria and they treated it with um, myrrh oil and it reduced the virulence in the nematode. But the problem is like, this is a nematode. It's not, it's not even like a lab rat, even like remotely close to like, you know, a mammal it's a nematode <laughs> so it's like why would you even bother um you know and so you know this is just like adding insult to injury it's like yeah we we, we tested it on like a culture and then we tested it on like a nematode uh, potent against staph infection uh staph infection in a nematode not a person or a rat or like a rabbit or whatever um so this is just really bad this is a hot mess um so these are the kind of things you have to watch out for when you're buying from essential oil people, like not Dr. Josh X. To say that these oils have proven anti-cancer or antibiotic properties is taking one massive leap of faith, as well as being grossly irresponsible. As someone who has experience in submitting products to the FDA, if you were to submit a drug with this kind of evidence, they'd laugh in your face and then promptly kick you out. Here's an interesting fact. Drugs that prove successful in the early phases of development and eventually move on to clinical trials, only about 10% actually get approved by the FDA. Oh, yeah, but your myrrh oil is definitely anti-cancer. Yeah, good job. And frankly, it's not just Josh Axe who's guilty of this. Other much larger essential oil firms use the same manipulation to bolster their products, which I'll be covering more in depth in a future video. In conclusion, essential oils marketed towards benign treatments like sleep aids, indigestion, or even improving memory are at the consumer's discretion and don't really have any major negative effects. Marketing essential oils to treat serious conditions, including cancer, is a no-no. On this stupid scale, I'm rating essential oils at a 7 out of 10, and on the harmful scale, at a 4 out of 10. Medicine.